Good evening. Welcome to the Korea Society. Welcome to Studio Korea. I'm Stephen Norper, the Senior Vice President, and we're delighted to have you here tonight in our studio audience. And to welcome Bruce and Juchan Fulton back to the Korea Society. Uh, we're delighted that they can join us here tonight on the first week of our summer policy and arts season uh, to discuss their wonderful translation of uh, Cho Chong Nae's How in Heaven's Name, a very compelling story of some lives and how they traversed the Second World War. So welcome back to you both and thank you for joining us here at the Korea Society. Thank you, Stephen. And I must say, uh, we were so moved here on the staff when we read this. In a very tight novella form, you were able to convey uh, Cho's wonderful uh, story of lives that have really uh, were remarkable in terms of uh, their suffering, in terms of their dislocation, uh, in terms of their quest for place and identity. And I'm wondering, Bruce, if you couldn't start us off with a little bit of the summary, what's the story about for those in our studio audience or viewing online or listening to podcasts who might not yet have read this remarkable work? Well, uh, the story begins with, uh, with uh, the American historian Stephen Ambrose's oral history of, of uh, D-Day. Um, and in the introduction, uh, or maybe the first chapter, we, uh, we read a, an anecdote about uh, the, when, the, when the Allied forces landed on, on the Normandy beaches among the prisoners that they... Uh, that they took were uh, a number of men wearing German Wehrmacht uniforms with Asian features speaking a language nobody understood. And uh, they turned out to be Korean. And uh, uh, SBS, one of the television networks in Korea, uh, picked up on this and made a two-part feature, which, uh, which Joe jung Nae saw. And uh, Zhou jung Nei historically has been very interested in illuminating the lives of people on the margins of, of modern Korean history with all its uh, catastrophic uh, events. And, um, and, and the result is this, is this short novel based on, uh, based on historical research he did and uh, based on the, on the lives of some actual, some young Korean men, one of whom... Uh, uh, lived until the 1990s in, in the United States. Uh, so what, what happened is, um, so the question is, how did, how did these young Korean men end up uh, on the shores of Normandy in, uh, in June of 1944? And uh, the answer uh, is that uh, in the late 1930s, like a lot of other uh, young Koreans, they were... Uh, they were more or less conscripted into the Japanese Imperial Army. They were called volunteer soldiers, but that's, uh, that's uh, a kind of a euphemism. And uh, they entered the Kwangdong Army, which was a very large, uh, a very large contingent, and they were sent to the, uh, to the area where Manchuria, Mongolia, and uh, the Soviet Union shared a common border. And uh, in, the, in the fighting there, they were captured by joint Mongolian and Soviet forces. And uh, the Soviets offered them the option of uh, repatriating them, not to Korea, which was a colony of Japan at the time, but to Japan, in which case they would have been summarily executed. Or uh, they could join the Soviet Red Army, uh, which they did. And, uh, and, and one of the reasons they did so is because uh, the man who was interpreting for the Soviet Red Army was himself an ethnic Korean, a Chosa Koryo Saram, a, uh, a Korean resident of uh, the Soviet Union. And so uh, as members of the Soviet Red Army, they were dispatched to Moscow around the time of the German offensive uh, against Moscow. They were captured there and spent a year and a half in a German prison of war camp, during which time approximately half of the population died from disease, overwork. Um, and then uh, in early 1944, with the Germans realizing that an Allied attack was imminent, they uh, asked 
the, uh, the prisoners of war, including the Koreans, if they wanted to join the German army, which they did. But their job uh, on the shores of Normandy was not, uh, was not as combatants, but to, um, to, to develop the uh, defense fortifications, and that's what they were doing, and ferrying ammunition when, uh, on June 6, 1944. So what happened after that? Well, they were taken uh, to the United States, and they, they spent some time at a couple of prison of war camps in the United States. And during this time, uh, the issue in their minds, the urgent issue, was to be repatriated to Korea. But this proved impossible because, uh, because they had formally joined the Soviet Red Army. And, uh, Meaning they'd, had, they'd been uh, given Russian names. Yes, and uh, Russian names, mm -hmm. and also for the purposes of repatriation, their nationality was Soviet. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in spite, the, they wrote a, a blood oath in one of the one of the American uh, prisons, but uh, it was all for naught. And uh, they were uh, returned after the war to the to the Soviet Union. The reason being that uh, there were some 100,000 uh, American prisoners of war uh, who had been recovered by the, uh, by the Soviet army when they overran the, the German prisoner war camps. And uh, this was kind of a prig quo quo. So the, uh, so the Koreans ended up uh, on a ship uh, back to St. Petersburg and... Um, and maybe we'll yeah. stop there. We'll There's stop. A spoiler alert. <laughs> exactly. Uh, because then the, their onward journey is an interesting. Exactly. But that issue of that issue of names, uh, which is you know something we certainly have heard a lot about in the broader discussion of history and popular memory, uh, especially in recent years with concerns about the experiences of the comfort women, uh, about the lost names of Koreans during the colonial occupation period, uh, and other issues uh, that have risen to the fore, territorial and others. Um, it puts this in an interesting context. Uh, they have the Soviet names, and then at one point names figure large when they are in the U.S., and they try through a blood letter to convey their identity as Koreans. Chuchan, could you talk a little bit about that issue of identity that's so critical in the book and, and how you felt about that as you're translating? Identity... Uh I think that comes down to why I chose this book, because when I read in Korean, I just, it was a choking feeling, and I have to translate. So, Bruce, we've got to share this with the world, world readers, that's why we started. And um, it's, uh, it's not just Korean, it's for the whole world issue that more and more we are dealing with the wars. And uh, for me, like, uh, I feel like my identity is also lost in a way when I came here. And so um, it's not just uh, Korean. And if you uh, want to do that way, it's so much of the, the strong and the weak and so much involved. And uh, <clears throat> I felt that um, all those times, uh, I was searching for something to pay back to Jo Jong Ne because um, we, for about ten years, um, do you know the uh, Roman flu of uh, his twelve volume mm. Tebek Mountains? Uh, he came to us to ask uh, uh, translate that book, mm. and I, I wasn't sure. Because we've been translating, we are translators, but same time we also find the publisher, and same time we try to promote the book. It's like uh, having a baby and make <laughs> sure that uh, you know, make sure that we find the right guy to send off a marriage. And uh, it's a hard, hard job, and especially uh, early 1990s and 19, uh, 2000. I wasn't sure that uh, America is ready for, uh, you know, at least a three volume, mm -hmm. uh, first three volume. And so at uh, that time, we said no. However, we got his trust. We are mm -hmm. nothing. We, we are just translators. And uh, this writer came to us to ask us translate. And uh, we could say no. How dare? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And uh, so his trust, mm -hmm. and it was something huge. And we are very glad that we'll be able to, you know, pay little debt mm -hmm. and so little book. And so, um, did I answer right? Oh. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, aside from that, that very touching tribute on trust and a great author, uh, also your notion of the universality of, of the appeal of this book as we consider what's happening with Russia and Ukraine or what's happening in Central Africa or Syria or too many places on the face of this globe. It's fascinating, fascinating story. I'm wondering if you could share a few of your readings from the book. Sure. Um, we prepared three different ones, but I think the, the one I'll choose um, will tell us how um, Shingilman is the uh, is the protagonist and how he ended up um, being in the in the Japanese Imperial Army. It's only a couple of pages. The volunteer soldiers, quote unquote, were volunteers in name only. In fact, they were coerced into enlisting because these young men would have to coexist with Japanese soldiers in the Imperial Army. Their basic qualification was that they be able to speak Japanese. This meant that they had to have graduated at least from primary school. So when the township offices received draft quotas from higher up, they first selected those with a primary school education. Next most desirable were the sons of tenant farmers who, being poor and powerless, were easily manipulated. Overcome by grinding poverty, unable to fill their stomachs three times a day, tenant farmers had reason enough to want to send their sons to primary school. School meant escape from the lot of being a tenant farmer. The abiding dream of tenant farmers was that a son of theirs might become a clerk. These clerks were the bane of their existence, and among the people they had direct contact with, the clerks exercised the greatest authority. And so the promise of town officials to grant a clerkship to a son upon discharge was the sweetest possible pacifier for the tenant farmers whose minds and hearts the Japanese had read so well. There was no tenant farmer unaware of the mortal danger his son would face when he went off to the army. The rumor that little Japan would go to war with big China had long been circulating throughout the peninsula. Thinking that the worst would happen if their sons died in combat, the tenant farmers were not easily appeased by the town officials' promises. With those who were reluctant, the officials took a different tack. All right, then, if you're not willing to cooperate for the sake of eternal prosperity for the great Japanese empire, then you can start packing your belongings. What for? You know what for. Manchuria. What? Families not wanting to be removed to Manchuria needed to produce a volunteer soldier. By now, it was widely known that life was hell in Japanese-occupied Manchuria. Korean tenant farmers had flocked there in response to Japan's promise to distribute ample land to them. That promise turned out to be a lie. Once this first wave of settlers had arrived, they were herded into collective housing, quote-unquote, surrounded by a high wall manned by armed Japanese soldiers in watchtowers. This settlement was no different from a prisoner-of-war camp. The Koreans were accommodated some 200 to a building, and during the day they tilled the soil under the watchful eye of Japanese soldiers. The land they worked had been seized from the Chinese, and there was a huge amount of it. But except for a subsistence allotment, the harvest went to the Japanese soldiers. Basically then the Koreans in Manchuria functioned as slaves who produced provisions for the Guangdong army. And so it was that the town and city officials in colonial Korea had to come up with the most outlandish charges against the tenant farmers using the barest of pretexts to keep shipping them off to Manchuria. For the powerless tenant farmers, next to losing their tenancy contract, the most frightening prospect was being packed off to Manchuria. You know why we gave you your name? Shin's father would say. The gil means good luck. And the man means 10,000. 
our way of wishing that good things happen to you the rest of your life. Keep your name in mind, trust in it, and do your best in everything. Shin smiled bitterly. Was it thanks to his name that he now found himself in this dismal, no way out situation in the grasslands of Manchuria and in Mongolia? If he was to survive, he'd need these good things to happen. No, his name merely reflected the hope of a father who had spent all his life in poverty. It was the sort of inelegant name that poor people invariably fashion for their children, like Chun Suk, Thousand Sacks, for a boy who might one day be a rich man whose lands yielded ample grain every year, or Manbok, Ten Thousand Blessings, for a boy who would enjoy a steady stream of good fortune. Thank you. Chu Chen, did you have uh, No, I, I like his uh, uh, very reading. Nice. Very nice, wonderful. <laughs> Put if if I could ask you, before we turn to the audience, um, what, what has Cho Chong Nei thought of this, and, and what do you want people to take away from this experience of what you've done so wonderfully as translators and he as a writer? He's a writer. Um, that's a very good question. Um, he's been writing 50 years, and nobody knows about Jo jong Ne in the outside of Korea. And the last year, we really had painful, uh, painful uh, experience. We had a book and almost went to Penguin to publish. But there is a uh, writer visiting here soon, Shin kyung Suk. They were comparing Shin kyung Suk and possible sale figure. And uh, right now, Korea, Korean literature is Shin kyung Suk and the other. Um, so that comes down to uh, last, uh, our past uh, literature sales. There are five million sellers, and in one Korean. is uh, in Korea. In uh, big, what is that? Book publishing. Book publishing mm-hmm. in Korea, and uh, uh, one is Shin Kyung Soo. The other four is actually Jo Jung Ne, and Tebek Sammek mm-hmm. is thirteen million sellers, and it's I like to see that Korean literature is not only Shin Kyung Soo, but all other writers. I I like to see it. And uh, especially in Korea, uh, if you hit 50, they somehow, writers and all other people, they, ten- they tend to think that we should retire. <laughs> and uh, just uh, title only. And he is 71 years old, and he's writing every day. And he is uh, he's a guy that knows challenge because buying a book, buying a book, especially Korea, is like a buying a um, luxury item. It's a show. And so reading is more difficult. Koreans, they don't read. <laughs> really, I tell you, Koreans don't read. And they love to read, especially translators' world literature. And so he knows challenge because a mm. uh, writer supposed to grab attention and fight with the young mind, their eyes flickering very fast, because they are so, uh, you know, they are more into visual culture and, uh, you know, gadgets. Mm-hmm. So he is trying to fight with that culture. And I like to show that I can write so your mind, you know, can turn into reading. And so if you are not happy with my book, I guarantee I will return money. Okay? <laughs> so I, I like that style. And uh, my meaning is, it's, it's good. However, the last summer we uh, met him, and he said all Korean writers think that he's an old geezer and why he's still right, and he should be choc- you know, choking to death, you know, something like that. So um, my meaning is, it's uh, something very admirable, and mm-hmm. I like to see that more writers, you know, enjoy his bravado and you know, got the attitude and mm. keep writing. And so we can have more books rather than just one type of Korean books mm-hmm. in the Western culture. That's mm-hmm. our... So a wonderful testimonial. And 
for those interested in purchasing the book, uh, here in the room we do have a few copies for sale. People can also contact you, but in particular for those viewing online or listening, uh, go to Amazon.com and they are able to get the book that way as well. Bruce and Juchan, thank you for the sustenance of this book. Uh, we have sustenance for our audience and yourselves <laughs> in the back of the room by way of refreshments, and we did want to give the studio audience a chance to meet you. Uh, some would like uh, to have you sign, and uh, we appreciate your time with that. And so we really are very grateful that you took the time to come all the way from Seattle for this, and uh, good luck with your ongoing adventures to San Diego and to Australia. And uh, you are always most welcome here at the Korea Society. Uh, your labors really do uh, edify and educate, uh, entertain, and inform. And uh, we thank you for your time this evening. We'd like to invite all of you back uh, for the next installment in the series on the politics of identity uh, with Susan Cox, who comes uh, from Oregon, not too far south of where the Fultons are. And uh, she will be sharing uh, her experience as one of the first generation uh, Korean adoptees to the United States and what it's meant for her generation as it now is entering uh, senior citizenship and as they reflect back on their experiences here in America. So that is on June 12th and we do hope that we can have you back for that. Uh, Bruce and Chuchan Fulton, thank you so much and thank you all for your time tonight. Thank, thank you. you to Nikita Desai, mm -hmm. who's organized this, to Sally and to all of our staff. Here.